Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, and uh, good morning, and welcome, everyone. Did you enjoy last night's uh, reception? Good. Good. Well, th thanks again to Layard for that. Uh, we, uh, we appreciate um, them putting that on. Uh, it's only going to get warmer. Um, certainly not in here, though, I think. But, uh, yeah, we've got a packed two days for you. So, uh, I'm, I'm here to welcome our keynote speaker this morning. And I, I perhaps know more about the business of our uh, headline speaker today than I perhaps should, uh, or you might think, because having a spouse in the floral industry, as a floral designer, um, has taught me a lot about the business of flowers and all of the hard work and the passion that goes into uh, the floral experience, if you will. Um, as chairman of, I believe, a very successful or American, great American success story, let, let's say that, that's something I certainly believe, uh, our headline speaker this morning is the very essence of um, pioneering entrepreneurship. Let's, let's, let's call it that. That's uh, certainly what I would, I would say. And his journey um, charts a story from uh, New York social worker all the way up to business veteran. And today, you'll find him as a regular in the media, commenting on everything from the economy to emerging technology. Now, he has graciously uh, accepted to take some questions from the audience at the end of his keynote this morning, so we're going to have runners with mics for that. So uh, without further to do, <laughs> here to talk about technology and the customer experience, building and deepening relationships, please give a very warm welcome to Jim McCann, CEO and Chairman of 1-800-Flowers. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see that you uh, bothered to come in last night. I know there's nothing to do here in this town. There are no distractions whatsoever. People who, like yourselves, who are experts on customer service must find it a little difficult to be in a town where the definition of good customer service is whether or not the bartender offers you a to-go cup as you leave the bar. <laughs> and thank you, James, for that kind introduction, and thank you for revealing your floristness. Uh, James' wife, Anya, is a very accomplished uh, floral designer. Travels the world doing a work. Uh, she told James, and he believed it, that she had to be away last Christmas to do a wedding in China. I'm sure he believed it, and I'm sure it's true, but I don't want you to worry at all, James. <laughs> but that's not the only floral connection in the audience. Katie Seek, who's right here, uh, I got to know in preparation for this event, is also has roots in the flower business. A husband who I know uh, is a famous wholesale florist in the States on the East Coast. Family's been in the business for a very long time. So there's a, a, there's a strong floral connection here. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, that, that's important to me. But I will confess to you that last night I took a little stroll after the reception. I wanted to see a little bit of New Orleans. And I'm here to report that it seems like the city's well on its way to being back to the good old days. I was walking uh, through the French Quarter. And uh, I made a turn, and all of a sudden I see something on the second story, and I couldn't quite make out what it was. And here it is, as I got closer, I could see there was a swing. And it would swing one way into the building and then swing out across the street and back in through the building. Obviously, to attract attention, and indeed attracted my attention. As I got closer, I looked up and I said, Katie? But, uh, <laughs> so the people here kind of do a lot to make people feel welcome around town, and I appreciate that. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a slight bit of a British influence around here. <laughs> I find these British folks to sound very sophisticated and smart. They make me feel quite humble. I will tell you that I'm not British. I know you're shocked. I, I happen to reign from the New York City area, uh, born and raised in New York City. And uh, some people might think that there's still a slight hint of a New York accent here. But in fact, I've been working very hard to overcome that. I'm working with an elocution coach from a prof with a, who's a professor at a university on Long Island. <laughs> His name is Professor Butterfuco. And uh, I think I'm making great progress. And we're well on our way to eliminating any trace of a, an accent. You know, at 1-800-Flowers, we're not a technology company. But in the earliest days, we were forced to be a technology company because we were doing things before there were companies like Kana in position to help us 
we, we were actually having to write code and do all those kinds of things because there were no services available. We were pioneers, as, as James indicated, out there on our own trying to figure this out. So it's great relief for us that we can focus on what we do well, which is design a, a great floral products and other gifts to help our customers. And we're in a very, very nice business. And I don't want to be in the technology business. I, we don't know enough about it. We don't have the bandwidth to be in it. And so we find it a great relief that there are companies like Connor, who we've worked with now for more than a dozen years, uh, that can help us do the things that help us to connect with our customers in a special kind of way. And what are we doing at the end of the day with our customers? We're helping them. We're helping them to express themselves, to connect to the important people in their lives. Uh, in, in a manner of speaking, we're there to help them act on their thoughtfulness. And the more convenient we can be for them, the more accessible we can be for them, uh, that means that they're going to have more opportunity to connect to the important people in their lives. Uh, the, uh, uh, the advent of all the new access technologies make it easier for people as they go through their busy days to say, well, I, this, this, uh, this lady, Katie, really helped me out a lot at this conference. She helped me with a transportation snafu we had. I'd like to say thank you. Before, they might have made a note. They might have tried to remember it and later on act on it. But now when they have a mobile device on them at all times, they can act on their thoughtfulness very quickly and, uh, and send a, uh, a note. They can send a, a, a floral gift. They can send a, a box of chocolates, something that expresses their appreciation and that sentiment of appreciation uh, that they had, but maybe in the past had not been able to act on as quickly and as fluidly as they like. And if they do, they have more relationships. They have better relationships, and that gives us a chance to help them uh, for more occasions in their lives. So it's a selfish but self-fulfilling uh, circle for us. I, I, I'm distracted because here you are, the pros in customer service. And I just last night at about 11.30 was on, uh, got involved in an email string which tells you the surprises that go on when you're dealing with the public. And I don't know the full story yet, but when I think of all the people in the audience who work with the public sector, I'm reminded about a public-private partnership that we, I, I don't know enough about, but the essence of it is one of our service reps last night at about 10, uh, 9.15 East Coast time was on with a customer, and she didn't like the way he sounded. And she notified a supervisor who came on a call, listened in, and then contacted 9-11 in that person's home community. Uh, police were dispatched, and about 11 o'clock last night, we got a call from the police department saying, your people saved somebody's life tonight in a suicide situation. So you never know what kinds of situations you're going to confront when you're involved in customer service. Normally, we're involved in creating all the smiles you can imagine in your life, but there are a string of thousands of people at 1-800-Flowers today with big smiles on their faces, knowing that one of their people was sensitive enough to understand what they think might have been going on, a supervisor who had the technology to interact and, and respond and uh, drawing the people who could appropriately respond to that situation. So as it evolves, I'll let you know more about it, but it's uh, just unfolding as we speak. Uh, Mark talked about the omni-channel experience, and that was, last night's experience for us is just one example of how we are and have to be omni-channel. Our customers insist on it, and they're also insisting on, on raising the level of service every day. So we don't have a choice as providers of service to say, I don't know if I'm going to go to the next stage. And we don't have a choice because our customers' expectations aren't set just by what we do. They're set by everything they read and see and encounter in the media. I began as a florist in 1976. When I was 112 years old, I started this business. And back then, it was pretty darn neat that we could deliver flowers next day and, in fact, the same day. And we were the only thing that you could do same day and next day. So if you forgot a birthday or an anniversary or another occasion, there weren't a lot of choices. We, we were the uh, last choice. Well, over those years, obviously, everything has emerged. And now our competitive set isn't just floral companies. Our competitive set is everybody who sells anything. And, uh, and FedEx and UPS have raised the standards on that. And it used to be good enough for us to be able to tell you, well, uh, was, were the flowers delivered? Well, have you heard that they weren't? And that used to be our response. It certainly cannot be our response today because our customers' expectations are changing. And we are watching very closely this 
stampede of investment and business formation around the idea of same-day delivery and within an hour delivery. And it's changing our world fairly dramatically. And we're retooling everything we do so that we're in position to take advantage of that. So today we're the a world's leading uh, flower and gift shop. And uh, when I say flower and gift shop, it means that we've expanded beyond uh, uh, flowers as our only gift item. Uh, I started with a single flower shop in, in New York City in 1976. And it was a small 800 square foot tiny flower shop on the east side of New York in Restaurant Row. And frankly, all we carried were flowers and plants. But as time went by, we started to carry other products. And chocolate became a very important product for us. And other edible gift foods. So right now, we're, half our sales are in uh, fresh flowers and half our sales and plants. And the other half are on our food gifts. And our food gift category is growing fairly dramatically. It's a very intimate gift when you can give something to someone else that they're going to consume. So a big focus for us is on, uh, is on uh, uh, the expansion of our gift food products. And uh, I, I understand someone here is from American Airlines. Somebody here from American Airlines? Well, I was traveling back and forth uh, to Dallas in the, uh, 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 several years ago on a regular basis. And I'm on American Airlines one day. And on my tray at the end of my meal is a, a cookie. And the cookie is uh, in a cellophane wrap. And I opened it up and I ate it. And I said, wow, this is a delicious cookie. And we had just started selling some baked goods on the 1-800-Flowers website. And this particular cookie was delicious. So I looked at it, and I saw it was from a company called Cheryl's. I stuck it in my pocket. And I gave uh, the company a call a week or so later and said, geez, I sampled one of your cookies on American Airlines. And it was, it was delicious. Uh, would you be interested in selling your products on our website? And Cheryl told me that, yeah, she'd like to do that. And we began a relationship. Well, a couple of years later, we were overwhelming them because we were selling so many of these delicious cookies and brownies that Cheryl's makes. And they're based in Columbus, Ohio. So uh, I was out visiting Cheryl one day, and she said to me, you know, this is going really well. However, I don't have the, uh, the gumption here to invest more because I need to build a bigger bakery because you're overwhelming us. Would you be interested in buying my company? And of course, we were, and we did. And a, a, a few years ago, I said to a young lady just a, a few years out of college who worked for us in the merchandising area, I said, uh, the way we bought this company was through product sampling that cookie that I had on the tray. And I said, if we could get more people to try these cookies, I, I think we could grow our sales. But how do we cost effectively do that? And I said to this young lady, I said, would you put together a couple of people, build a team, and come up with an idea of how we can get more of these cookies into people's hands? Our average price point is around $30 at Cheryl's. And I said, it'd be great if we could sell individual cookies somehow. Well, they came up with a clever idea that we introduced last year. It's called cookiecard.com. And uh, it's a little box about uh, four and a half by four and a half, an inch deep. And in it, and it opens up, and it's a card. It can personalize the message, hey, happy birthday, Sarah. Hope you have a great day. And in it will be an individual cookie, individually wrapped, or buttercream frosted cookies. And the whole thing delivered is $5. Now, we don't make money at $5. You can be assured of that. But these now three, first two, now three young ladies uh, introduced this program last fiscal year. Our fiscal year begins July 1st. So last year they introduced this program, no marketing budget. You've heard that before, right? <laughs> no marketing budget. And just on our site, on the Cheryl site alone, sold 200,000 cookie cards. Now, you say, what's the big deal if, if you don't make money at it? Well, the big deal is... 30% of those customers who buy the cookie card in the first six months come back and become regular customers. So we found the holy grail here, a sampling technique that makes money, not on its original sale, but in terms of getting new customers in. So we have a management meeting once a quarter. And we took our management meeting to Columbus, Ohio this past uh, April. And we had these three young ladies come in and present. And we have a horseshoe-shaped table, very intimidating. And these three young ladies, the oldest of which is 29, come in and they have a slideshow for us uh, answering some questions I've posted them about the next year. And uh, they went through their slideshow and they said, Jim, we're going to meet your goal of selling a million cookies this year. I said, that's terrific. And she said, but we have one more slide. And Jim, it's an answer to your next question, which you haven't yet asked us, which is, yes, we'll be prepared to sell five million next year. 
and indeed they're well on a pace to sell more than a million of them this year. And they came up with a very clever campaign. Uh, uh, everyone familiar with a lady who's been on the radio for 20 something years in the evening named Delilah? Yeah. Well, Delilah I've come to know now and, and, and break bread with more than a few times in the last six or seven weeks because these young ladies reached out to her and they des designed a line of cookie cards for Delilah that she'll be using all throughout her show. Every time she gets a call that she thinks is interesting or needs a pick-me-up. So we've developed a whole line. The point is the talent in your company isn't in the department with the appropriate name on the door. These young ladies took over this idea that doesn't say marketing on their card. It doesn't say new product introductions. It just is talented, bright, aggressive young people who are having a blast and making me have a blast. Watch them and applaud them from the back row. So the cookie card campaign has been a huge and wonderful campaign for us. I mentioned that we began 37 years ago. Our name at that time was Flora Plenty. And uh, I, as uh, uh, James mentioned, I have only had two careers in my life. The first was as a social worker. I ran a home for teenage boys in New York City. The th common thread in my two careers is the fact that I'm an Irish Catholic kid from South Queens, New York. I had a genetic requirement to be a bartender. <laughs> and working in my a neighborhood uh, pub, uh, one of my friends worked at this St. John's Home for Boys. And he ran a group home in one of the toughest neighborhoods in New York City. And every time he'd come in, I'd always be asking him a lot of questions about, about, uh, about working in the home. And finally, he said, you know, it sounds like you'd really be interested in this. Why don't you come visit us some night? So I did. I uh, went and had dinner with he and the guys, 10 teenage boys, let's call it 15 to 20 years old. And uh, it was, so it's an individual house, a, a brick two-story house with a big cement stoop. Uh, ten boys, some in one, one, one to a bedroom, two to a bedroom. And then there was a live-in counselor who would uh, come on duty at 4 o'clock, be on duty to midnight, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, get the kids up and out to school. So I go and have dinner with uh, Bob and these, uh, and these young guys. And uh, after dinner, he gets me on the side and says, do you think you'd like to give this work a try? So I said, yeah, I think I, think I would. Now, I was well on a way to be a New York City policeman because I figured that, that was the other... Uh, cost me from the neighborhood I grew up in. Our role models were civil servants, firemen, policemen, uh, shopkeepers. There's some people who would put a suit on and go into Manhattan and do something, but I can never figure out what they did in those offices. We did have some entrepreneurial role models in the community. I lived on a block. At the other end of the block was a gentleman by the name of John Gotti, who was an entrepreneur of sorts. But my father encouraged me not to follow in his footsteps because they had a very bad retirement program. But, so I went to the police academy in New York City and, and, and thought that would be a, a wonderful career. But then I got hooked on this social work thing because when Bob said, would you like to try it? I said, yes. He flipped me the keys and said, you're on duty tonight by yourself. And it was a great career for me. It helped me to grow up. It helped me to learn an awful lot about myself. It got me to learn an awful lot about how you form relationships before you do anything else. And that if you don't, you're not going to have success and you're not going to have good connection. And we know that uh, connections matter. And in this case, experience counts very, very much. Now, I had the same problems you had when you went to work, every, that you, when you go to work every day. You know, the people carrying guns and knives, the same things you deal with, I had to deal with then. And frankly, I was horrible at the work. Uh, but it was run by an order of uh, priests and brothers. And the fellow who ran the home uh, refused to let me quit when I went to him and told him I had to leave because I was either going to cause somebody to be hurt, get hurt myself. I was terrible at it. And he taught me about forming relationships. And at the end of the day, what I realized, in spite of the fact that these are tough guys, these are the kind of kids I don't want you to meet when you came, uh, come to visit us in New York. These guys are so tough, they had hair on their teeth tough. But what I learned over the next uh, couple of years living in that group home uh, was that they were no different than me. I, I grew up very close to where some of them grew up, but it was a worlds apart. And, and the world apart part was that they didn't, they didn't, they wanted the same things I did. Corny as it may sound, they wanted to feel comfortable. They wanted to know what the rules were. Uh, they wanted to love and they wanted to be loved. And that's what I wanted, and it was how you broke through all the other junk to get there that mattered. 
Now, working in the not-for-profit world was important to me, and I did that for 14 years. First four years, I lived in the group homes, ran the group homes, and then I became the administrator at a very young age of this home. I also married very young. Uh, luckily, uh, I found a saint who was clueless, and, and I, she married me anyway. And, uh, and we started a family very young, and they wanted to do some really strange things, these kids, like eat and go to school. And so working in the not-for-profit social work world was a challenge because even as the administrator, I made no money. So I was always doing things on the side. Ah, back to bartending. So now my job is Monday through Friday. It's not the 24-7 job it was when I lived in a group home. And uh, what uh, uh, I decided to pick up uh, work on the side. So I'm back to bartending now in Manhattan on First Avenue at the original TGI Fridays. And I'd work there Friday and Saturday nights. One of my customers, a young man, Greek-American, sitting at the end of all one Saturday night, we'll call him uh, Scotch and Soda, uh, tells me that he owns a flower shop across the street and he's going to sell it. I said, flower shop. Nice business. Retail, I can understand that. Back in my neighborhood in Queens, one of the most successful storekeepers owned a big flower shop on his main intersection corner. So I said, do you mind if I come work there a couple of Saturday afternoons before I come to the bar? Maybe I'm a buyer. He said, sure. So I did, and I worked there several Saturday afternoons. And I said, I like this. So for $10,000, I bought this flower shop. For the next 10 years, I continued to work at the home and on the side, open up another flower shop every six months. Because I didn't go in this just to be a florist. I went in this to try and grow a business. And so uh, I, I didn't have a lot of days off, like none. And, uh, and I... Uh, finish up work, 5 or 6 o'clock at the home, go to the flower shops, work, uh, work there till 9 or 10 o'clock when we'd close, and then start over. It's amazing how uh, I set the holiday schedule for the home, for the, all the employees. We had 230 employees at the home. We had 175 boys. And uh, it's amazing how when you're a florist on the holiday schedule, Valentine's Day becomes an official holiday. But I needed the day off to go work at the homes. <laughs> So uh, we changed the calendar a bit there. So here we are 37 years later, and what I'm trying to do is replicate the same experience that I had back in my earliest years on First Avenue in that 800 square foot flower shop. The important thing there was our customers weren't just our customers, they were our friends. They would stop into our shop to make themselves a cup of coffee, uh, to, uh, to uh, ask if we, uh, they could drop off their dry cleaning, ask us for a recommendation in terms of a restaurant around the corner because they were bringing some friends in from out of town that weekend. They stopped in not just to transact, but they stopped in just to hang out, grab the old uh, director's chair that we had on the side, sit down and chat with us, comment on some of the flower arrangements we had lined up on the floor for a wedding we were doing the next day, telling us they didn't like the way the white stock looked in it, maybe we could use something else. We had a relationship with our customers. And 37 years ago, truth be told, it was probably only 37 customers that made up our business, were the heart of our business. Now fast forward 37 years to today, when we have 37 million customers, we're still trying to emulate or replicate that same kind of experience we had with customers back then. That is, we don't want them just to come to us when they have a transaction that they want to do. We want them to interact with us in other ways, and we see that happen more and more, and that can only happen with the effective use of technology. It's the only way you can know who your 37 million customers are, what they're interested in, what they're not interested in, how they choose to engage with you, let them volunteer to increase their level of engagement with you. So we do that in all kinds of ways, but, uh, uh, but we couldn't do it, and we couldn't even begin to approach that unless unless we had effective use of technology. And I remember uh, back in, uh, uh, I, I would describe it that we've had four uh, waves in our business. The first, uh, the first wave is that uh, uh, retail stores. So we call that the first wave. One store which became 20 something stores all in and around the New York City area. Then in 1986, uh, I heard about 85, 85. 85, I heard about a company that had the telephone number 800 Flowers, and I thought, boy, that could really change things around here. Uh, if people, because uh, I remember at that time, it's, it's ancient history for you young folks, but back in the uh, mid-80s, I remember uh, Sheridan, the hotel company, spending millions and millions and millions of dollars 
with TV advertising to get us to remember their number, which was 800-325-3535. And they had singers and dancers and all kinds of routines just to get you to remember their number. Well, I thought if I could get the telephone number 800 Flowers, you don't have to do a lot of singing and dancing to get people to remember your name and your number. Well, I did uh, uh, back to Dallas, Texas. The company was based in Dallas, Texas, and it just tanked. Didn't officially go bankrupt, but was gone. And so I uh, commuted to te Dallas, Texas for two years, wound up buying what was left of the company. And uh, so I figured, I'm going to be a smart aleck. I'm a wise guy from New York City, so I'm not going to waste money on bankers and lawyers and accountants and do that due diligence thing before I buy this company. I'm going to skip all of that. I wound up doing due negligence. And I signed for the company, which, and the only asset that it had that I wanted was this telephone number. And in 1986, I got control of it and also found out six months later, it owed out $7 million more than I knew about. And I now owed out that $7 million, which gave me an interesting hairline and a reason to get up in the morning. Uh, because I had to work through this mess I created by being a smart aleck. But the good news is, over the next uh, four or five years, it uh, came our way. And it became a brand, it became a national brand, and we became the poster child for a new way of doing business, especially in the flower industry. And as Katie would tell you, people in the flower industry say, this is the way it's done, nothing's going to change. The experts in this industry told us people don't want to order flowers on the telephone. They certainly don't want to call an 800 number. They don't want to do it 24-7. They don't want to use credit cards over the telephone. And they certainly don't want to guarantee that the flowers are going to last. All the things we were told were rock-solid information in the flower business. Obviously, it wasn't the case, and we were smart enough or dumb enough to ignore them and go about it. Second wave hits our shore. Now, the 800 number. We changed the name of our company to 800 Flowers, changed the name of our stores to 800 Flowers, which people thought was the freakiest thing they'd ever seen. I'm traveling back and forth uh, to Dallas like a crazy person. And now I put 10 years of work, my 20-something stores online. I owe out $7 million, and I'm sitting on an American Airlines flight one day listening to uh, the gentleman next to me, who was clearly a Texan. He was an older gentleman. And he had one of those big old buckles and his nice, nice boots. And he had a big old hat and a rack above us. And uh, he told me he was from Dallas and we're chatting. And I said to him, sir, what business are you in? He says, I'm in the Earl business. I said, the Earl business? He said, that's right, son, the Earl business. I said, I, I don't understand. He said, son, Earl, O-I-L, Earl. <laughs> I said, well, that, that, that's nice. And he said to me, son, what, what business are you in? I figured, well, he's a big-time businessman in Dallas, Texas. His company was born there. Surely he's heard about it. I just put $3 million down, everything I'd accumulated, 10 years working like a crazy person. I now owe out $7 million more in debt. But it was, it's all going to be worth it because of the power of this name and the brand. I said to him, sir, I'm in the flower business. And he said, what's the name of your company? Well, first of all, I said, I'm in the flower business. And he goes, well, that's nice. And then he said, uh, what's the name of your business? And I said, uh, it's uh, 800 Flowers, sir. And he says, well, that, that's nice. And he said, son, why wouldn't you call it 799 Flowers? I said, we have some money to spend here on marketing. <laughs> Next days, the third wave is my younger brother Chris, 10 years my junior, graduates from university, comes to work with me in the 1986 time frame, just as about to do this 800 flowers thing. He's into technology. We're always exploring the new technologies. Good accidents befall us. I, I befriend a fellow by the name of uh, Ted Turner. Uh, I'm at a conference like this, and I wind up sitting next to Ted Turner. And he and I just connect. And he's still one of my uh, heroes and friends. And uh, he had launched something then called CNN, which was still in its earliest years. And uh, I said to him, geez, I'd love to be able to advertise. And lo and behold, he said, son, we're going to teach the world that you can do direct response advertising. Because he wanted to class up the advertisers on his network. It was all uh, album collections and things like that. And he said, you could class up my network. And we're going to teach the world that you can do direct response and build the brand at the same time. Or as he called, sell the pork chops and build the brand. And so he took me under his wing. And we became, our only advertising was on CNN. And all of a sudden, we're creating a national brand because there weren't all these other competing news networks at the time. It was just CNN. Now, we're investing in all these new technologies, but the, the brand, the telephone number is everything for us. Uh, we stop expanding stores. The, the brand is taking off. And now it's 1991. The Persian Gulf War is about to break out. The country is apprehensive. 
very nervous. We're told about what uh, ferocious fighters these Iraqis are and how dangerous this was going to be, and the whole company was on edge. And I get a call from Carol, who worked for Ted Turner, that Ted would like to speak with me. He'd like to ask me a favor. Ted Turner wants to ask me a favor. So I chat with him. I said, what's, what's, what's the story? Uh, uh, Carol says, well, he'd like you to uh, uh, keep your advertising on if the war breaks out. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, all our other advertisers are dropping their schedules. And he'd like you to leave it on because he thinks it'll be all right. He doesn't think it'll be a, a bad a brand exposure for you. So I trust Ted. I know he's so much smarter than I am. So I said, fine. Next, Ted calls and says, I'd like you to do me another favor. I said, Ted, how can I do you another favor? He goes, if perchance I can't convince enough people to stay on the air if the war breaks out, would you agree to let me run your spot extra? Now, back then, we're buying less than a 1% share of the market, a 0.8 share. And uh, uh, the war does break out. And we agreed to leave our spot on. Everybody else canceled. Everybody in the country and around the world was focused on CNN during the breakout of the war. And as you know from history, it went very, very well. We became very, very proud. American was uh, jo joyous about the results. And it was a war brought to you by 800 Flowers because we were the only advertiser <laughs> on CNN. Now, I don't want to be a pig here, but that was in January. I have already mentioned to you that Valentine's Day is an important day for us. The first President Bush was wise enough to stop the campaign and not go to Baghdad. But had he gone to Baghdad, it would have taken us right through the Valentine period, and we would have had the most extraordinary holiday in history. But I don't want to be a pig about it. But here we are, 1991, 92. Uh, we're online now, so the third wave hits our shores. And it's really starting to matter to us. The idea of, uh, of uh, technology impacting our business. And my brother Chris and I have a decision to make because we can either go, we had to decide which online provider we were going to go with, AOL or Prodigy. Prodigy is Sears and IBM. And they're based in White Plains, New York, and these guys have suits. These are serious people. They're already a big brand. And then there's another little outfit down in Virginia called AOL. One of the guys, a guy by the name of Ted Leonsis, my brother Chris and I knew from his previous software experience. And we had dealt with him and knew him and liked him and trusted him. So we go down to have dinner with uh, Ted and this young fellow by the name of Steve Case, who he wanted us to meet, who is the CEO of AOL and founder. So we have dinner with the two of them, and at the end of the day, I, I, my brother and I go to the laboratory, and I said, I have no idea what the heck these guys are talking about. But I like them, and I trust them, don't you? And he said, well, that's why I brought you down here. So we decided to go with, uh, with AOL over Prodigy, which everyone thought was the dumbest move in the world. But we bet on people. We bet in the context of a relationship. And boy, did it work out for us. We were the first merchant of any kind to transact on AOL. We... Uh, uh, we uh, built our business on the back of AOL and its growth in the early days, and frankly, we've uh, never looked back. So our third wave was the online world. By 1995, it was starting to matter, the online world, but not that much. And then Netscape came along, introduced a browser, organized the internet, and now it really started to matter. And a, a guy who was the COO of, of uh, AOL at that time, Bob Pittman, who was a good friend of my brother Chris and I, uh, convinced us that uh, we didn't know how long the war was going to go on for eyeballs, uh, so we had better get public and make sure we had enough money in the uh, kitty, because we were doing this all out of our pockets, and, uh, and that was okay, except that in 1998, we went from zero competitors to 21 finance competitors by venture capital firms, and they had some serious money. So we went public, and it worked out well for us. I mentioned the good accidents that befell us. AT&T... Uh, uh, when all of a sudden the government decided that uh, you own the number, not the carrier, there was MCI, Sprint, AT&T, all fighting for our business when they didn't have to fight for it before. And so AT&T asked me to appear in one of their ads as a progressive user of 800 number services and their advanced feature set. And so I agreed to do that in, uh, in 1992 and in the spring. And uh, it was supposed to run for one week in May, and it did. And it did very, very well. It had a huge impact for us because I was identified as Jim McCann from 1-800-Flowers, founder of 1-800-Flowers, and, and it was very good for us. And it was a nice experience, and we were very glad. It was right after Mother's Day. That was great. But then they called back and said, it tested so well. Would you sign another contract with us? We'd like to run it 
for the rest of the summer, which was the summer of the most successful Olympics ever, and they were the key sponsors, so it ran three times a night during the most watched Olympics ever. So another good accident befell us and, uh, and helped us to now have this important brand in 1-800-Flowers. And so accidents and good fortune have, have been an important ingredient for us. The next accident that I'd like to tell you about also involves TV. And uh, I'm, I'm fortunate uh, that I get an opportunity to speak to an audience every now and again, write a book every now and again, is, and as uh, James mentioned, go on TV and talk about things I know nothing about. So I have a lady, an agent uh, of mine, who's at ICM, who handles that kind of stuff for me. And she's a, a Korean-American gal named Patty Kim. And uh, she switches agencies. She used to be at another agency, and she switches to ICM. ICM happens to represent a uh, producer uh, out of the UK who's doing a TV show called The Undercover Boss. And she calls me up and said, Jim, in her accented, uh, uh, crisp voice, and said, I understand that you talked to the producers about the show, The Undercover Boss, and you've turned it down. I said, yeah, Patty, I did. She said, you're a damn idiot. <laughs> so marketing genius that I am not, I had turned the show down three times. It sounded too hokey for me. I didn't want to do it. There was no way that I could go undercover in our company and not be recognized. They suggested I could wear a big red afro, and, and, and I said, that's not going to happen. Uh, but she said, but Patty said to me, I'm coming to your office on Monday. I'm bringing the executive producer. She's flying in from the UK. I'm coming in from California. We're meeting in your office on Monday. She did come in, and they showed me a copy of the first episode that they'd already produced uh, that hadn't aired yet, and it featured the people from Waste Management. And after I watched it in my office with them, I said, wow, this is better and much different than I thought. So I said, okay, I'll agree to do the show, but I won't do it. And I won't tell you exactly what Patty said, but she can be profane. <laughs> and uh, I said, here's, here's my pitch to you. We'll do it, but let's play the brother angle. My younger brother, 10 years my junior, is taking on more and more responsibilities in the company. Instead of this opening boardroom scene, it'll be opening scene with he and I, and I send him undercover as part of his growth uh, uh, process to learn more and more about the company. Well, we do, and let me show you a clip from that show now. Nice How are you? Nice to meet you too. Come on in. How long have you been here? This store opened two years ago in January. I've been here since, mm -hmm. but I've been doing this 25 years. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Long time. It's, it's like a family shop, you know? That's great. Hi, guys. This is my boyfriend. Let me say good morning. Good morning, sweetheart. I think I will. You like this one? Like that one? Do you have to? Do you, am I going to get my help? Oh, thank you, love. Do you come in here all the time? Yeah, yeah, we love it here. It's the only flower shop we go to. I mean, the kids come in here and they love it. And the D's so friendly. I mean, we have had other florists here, but they just don't have a knack that D does. How are you? Oh, how, how are you? Good, how are you? Is this Melinda? She's picking up corsages. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, small enough? Yeah, that's okay, great. Okay, good. You build up a lot of relationship with your customers, it looks like. These people are coming to my home, so I want them to be treated like they're at my home. So the theme there is, the theme that's uh, present for our company, it's all about building a relationship first. And uh, so we're an omni-channel retailer. We've had three waves that I described to you so far. First was retail. The second was the telephone, the 800 number. The third was the use of the technology. The first way, uh, phase of that was the, uh, the internet, the online world. And, uh, but we've never abandoned the stores because that's where real connectivity takes place. And the visibility of our stores, uh, we have uh, about 400 branded stores around the country. We have a network of florists, another 7,000 florists around North America who are part of our network, not branded, but part of our BloomNet network that fill our orders for us. It's all about the relationship, and there's no place better than that for that relationship than that in-person relationship, which is, I think, what we're all trying to replicate in the ways that we provide service and contact for our customers today. That was a great experience for us. That show uh, uh, aired, it was the last show of the first season of Undercover Boss. It was the highest rated show they've ever had, except for the Waste Management show, which premiered after the Super Bowl that year. So 53 million people have seen that show. Uh, it's uh, like an infomercial for 1-800-Flowers. My brother Chris did a terrific job. He had to do all the hard work. The only ask that CBS had when I, when I made my proposal about, we'll do it our way and send my brother undercover, 
was, okay, but you have to, if we're going to do this brother-brother thing, you have to agree to surprise him while he's in the field, and he cannot know that you're coming. We want to get his reaction. So I said, so you want me to torture my younger brother? <laughs> That's easy. I've been doing that my whole life. <laughs> That's what older brothers do. So uh, we had a, uh, I was in China, and they said, okay, when you come back, we're shooting a scene at your farm. We have a farm in Carpinteria in California where we grow a lot of uh, lilies and things, and, and you'll, uh, uh, you'll sneak up on him there. We'll be in the field. It'll be a whole good scene there, and, and he won't want to break cover. That's the whole gist of it. And it works out, uh, it works out that uh, Carpentry only gets four or five days of rain a year. We got six of them that week, so we couldn't shoot that, so I skipped him. And then I popped in on him on a shop we have in Brooklyn when he was working undercover. And we have a terrific young man uh, who works in that shop on the weekends as the assistant manager. He was only 20 years old. Uh, and I, so I have a gal who works for me call to say, Jim's going to be in the neighborhood. He'd like to stop in the shop. My brother hears this, and he's like panicking. And uh, so, but he really gets upset because they're all running around cleaning up the store, making sure it looks perfect because Jim is coming. And he's over there going, they don't do this for me, you know. <laughs> but it was great. So I got to sneak up on him and, uh, and torture him in that store. And he did everything he could not to break cover. And on camera, I get Jose on the side. I said, Jose, how's this, uh, this uh, fellow who's here on that jobs program? Is he going to make it? And he looks at me and he goes, nah. <laughs> And I play that tape on a continuous loop in my office at all times. <laughs> so my job now is, is, is fun. It's interesting. By the way, we have a new show coming out. We did another reality show. Uh, I know you'll want to put this in your calendars. September 26th on uh, A&E at 11 p.m., they asked us to do another reality show called The Pitch. And this is a situation where Chris and I uh, uh, present a uh, marketing challenge. Uh, that you guys would all identify with to a couple of different ad agencies and then they would go behind the scenes watching these agencies developing their ideas and their pitch uh, to us and we pick one and, and decide to go ahead with that company. So it was fun to do, it was very quick to do uh, and uh, you'll see uh, the behind the scenes have some very creative folks in the, in the LA area came up with some ideas. But I have the greatest job in the world now. Chris runs the company, he runs all the operations of the company, I get the cause trouble, I continue to uh, stalk him and cause trouble for him. And my job is to incite and incent our engagement with our customers. And it's tools like Connor brings to the table that, are, that allow us to do that. And we have some really successful products, all of which have been suggested by our customers. Uh, I have a lady from Ohio who uh, uh, tried with her sister to make some centerpieces for the third sister's uh, bridal shower. And she sent me the pictures and said, clearly, we didn't succeed but I bet your designers could do something interesting with this. And that created what you see there in the center is a, a collection we call the Happy Hour Collection. Those big, two foot tall, oversized martini glasses. And our customers came up with the idea. They've refined the idea. They came up with the names of all the products. So it's the margarita, the uh, green apple martini, uh, all the different versions of that. Our customers suggest all of those. They test them. They vote on them. Uh, they came up with a marketing campaign, and one of our customers said, why don't you test this? This is a product that needs to be seen, and it needs to be seen big. So we decided to only launch it on out-of-home media. And we did it market by market. It's the single biggest selling product ever int introduced in the floral category. It's just fun. It puts a smile on faces. When you walk into a, a, a room, uh, and there are a bunch of cocktail tables, and there's a different one of these on every table, it just screams fun. Uh, so the Happy Hour Collection, and, uh, suggested by customers. On the lower uh, uh, side of that, you'll see a little puppy in a, in, a, uh, in a basket. One of our customers said to me, one of our older customers, I remember when you used to, Jim, make those little poodles in a basket. I said, yeah, it's a long time ago. So I was down in our, our design center in the bottom, uh, the ground floor of our office building where we have a store and a design center and an education center. And I said to a couple of our designers, said, remember we used to make those poodles in a basket? Could we freshen that idea up some? And they came up with this, uh, with the, this uh, new fangled dog in a basket. And one of the gals who works on our direct marketing group was walking through, and she looks and she goes, now that's a doggable. And that became the name of the product, the Adogable Collection. And we'll sell one million Adogables this year. They come in all different versions. Our customers forever suggesting new ideas. So we have the Santa Paws uh, collection. We have one for every ho holiday. Halloween, you'll see this year, hysterical. 
but people just love it because it puts smiles on your faces, and that's the business we're in. That's the evidence of our success are the smiles that we create. Back to that happy hour collection, engaging our customers. Uh, so you see Santa Paws there, and of course Thanksgiving is not complete without the Pilgrim Pooch. And our happy hour collection continues to grow all the time. We're over a million units of it, as I mentioned, and, uh, and I think the dog book collection's quick on its heels, uh, uh, barking up their tree, so to speak. Uh, but our customers uh, get out of control with all the different ideas they come. I don't know if you noticed, but there's no filter. 24-7, your customers are in contact with you. They don't understand why you don't respond to their good idea at 11.30 on Sunday night. But it's hard to manage, but it's fun. And one of the, uh, this is, uh, so all of the products were suggested by our customers. All of the copy and marketing came from our customers. The means we use came from our customers. Uh, sometimes they get a little bit more risque than they should. And uh, uh, they, uh, they certainly do enjoy sharing their ideas, but sometimes they get a little out of control. <laughs> One of the things that is still my job today is to go around and incent uh, trouble, incite fun uh, around the shop. And I remember uh, uh, we had a customer service team that was separate from a, a data team in our service center. And uh, the lady who ran the two areas was having a terrible time marrying these two functions. And so she and I was at one of our events, uh, uh, all gathered, and we were having some wine and cheese. We're also in the wine business, and we were sampling some uh, new wines from a couple of new uh, 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 wineries that we worked with in Napa Valley. And I'm, she's chatting with me, telling me this problem. And I said, well, why don't you just go ahead and do it then? She said, do what? I said, marry those two ideas. And so what she did, took that conversation, and she arranged a wedding. And they had a bride and a groom and ushers, and they had a reception, and they married the two departments. And so here you have 600 people come to this wedding, and uh, trust me, after that wedding and the reception and the laughing and the fun and the idiocy of the whole idea, those two departments realized they were now one. And uh, so my job is to try and incent and, and create these crazy things that go on in the shop, all of which contributes to your culture, all of which has an influence on how people think about you. One of the things that we used to do, and now it's done electronically, is we used to have big binders. And so when someone would come in to learn about how to work with our customers, all our new uh, customer service folks, they used to have these binders put in front of them. They could read them. And the binders were letters from customers who wrote to tell us about something good that someone had done at a company, on a delivery, on a phone call, and the things that they did to interact. I remember years ago, a lady named Gloria, who was a supervisor for us, one Valentine's Day, just couldn't find anyone who could get it out there at this last minute. And Gloria took over on this and worked on it for about two hours. And what she wound up doing was getting the, the hardware store owner in the nearby town, who was also the police sheriff, uh, who knew this lady's house and where it was, agreed that if we got the flowers delivered to his hardware store, that he would, after work, drive the 35 minutes or so that we're taking to get to this mountain uh, to deliver these flowers. And that's just an example of what people do. And then my job is to make sure we celebrate Gloria, that she knew even on the busiest day of the year, taking two hours to make sure that that lady smiled and sent us a note that was in that binder about how it was the most happiest day of her year, that her nephew uh, remembered her, that he sent the flowers, and that we went through such pains to make sure she got them there that day. That's, you can't teach that. We used to do it in these binders saying, how are you supposed to handle your customers? Handle them in such a way that they're incented to write to Chris or me about what a good job you did. Now, because our service agents work all over the world and they work from home, uh, we do that electronically, but the idea and the message is the same. We try and incent them to treat people in such a way that they're incited to write a letter about how well they were cared for. And as you know, that gets tougher every day. Now, the fourth wave. The fourth wave is uh, everything mobile. And, uh, and mobile devices are taking over our lives. I'd say the, these mobile devices now are not mobile devices. These are the remote controls of our life. They, uh, they, everything we do now is through those devices, the way we interact, the way we uh, control things, the way we consume news, video, communicate with all the different uh, tools that are available. Uh, it's all done through a mobile device. And it's a real challenge for us. Uh, this past Mother's Day, Mother's Day is the biggest floral holiday for us, and it, and it can be uh, chaotic. And one that I was always anxious about, my brother and I both, 
because we weren't delivering the level of customer service that we would uh, like. Uh, so we huddled with these crazy people from this outfit. You may have heard of them. Kana? Anyone hear of them? I know about 50 people in the room have heard of Kana. We huddled with them this past spring, and we brought in our team, and normally we try and manage to a budget for Valentine's Day, and we said this year, Chris and I said to the team, including the Kana team, and uh, Rich uh, Cockshot was a big part of that team uh, and, uh, from Kana, and uh, Rich is uh, based on the West Coast, and we would have daily meetings at 7 or 8 a.m., 8 a.m. normally, and 7 a.m. at the holiday time. And Rich was on every one of those calls, in spite of the fact that he was traveling, he was all over the country, and most of the time in California. And you know it's three hours earlier in California than it is for us on the East Coast at 7 a.m., and he was still on those calls every day. Because we said, we want to deliver the best customer experience we can, not just the other uh, 51 weeks of the year, but right through Mother's Day. We don't want to be queuing calls. We don't want to be telling people we have to call them back. We don't want to uh, be busying people out. We want to handle every call. So rather than having this much available for a staffing budget, your goal is on a quality side, we'll take the risk that using this new software, tool, this kind of express software tool, that we can deliver a great quality experience and still have it be affordable. So instead of having a budget, how many hours they had unlimited budget in terms of training dollars and labor dollars. We delivered the best Mother's Day we've ever had. I'm standing there at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning before Mother's Day, normally bedlam. Your, your incoming calls are overflowing. Your, your customer service queues, you're not able to keep up with the demand. Uh, it's just chaos. And there we were. We had no calls in queue, more volume than we'd ever seen in the past. But the idea of giving, empowering people, giving them the right tools and the right budget, we came in at the best margins we ever had for Mother's Day. We spent more on labor. And it turned out to be good at the end because our customer service issues were reduced dramatically. So the use of good third-party partners, good internal resources where people know they're empowered to think differently and think creatively. And if we all know what the goal is, which to delight your customers, it's amazing that magic happened and it did for us. And a reaction on the social networks where people are quick to tell you if you're not good. They're quick to tell you. I remember in the earliest days of social networks, there was a program called Lost. Remember that show? And it had a blog. And it was Valentine's Day in the East Coast. A fellow from Boston comes onto a blog on Valentine's Day and said, 1-800-Flowers ruined my life. Here's how he ruined his life. Valentine's Day, a Wednesday, snowstorm coming up the East Coast. Our Bostonian outlet, our, our franchisee in Boston, sees that there's no chance that he's going to make that delivery on Wednesday because offices are shutting down. Takes the liberty of delivering the flowers a day early, the afternoon of the 13th. And then it, he put on the flowers, he put a note saying that because of the impending storm, the likelihood that you might not get to the office or we might not get to you, we took the liberty of sending these early because we want you to know that someone loves and cares for you, and that's why we did this early. I hope you understand. And here's a, a gift certificate for a bouquet. You can come in any time in the future get that because we appreciate your understanding. So this happened to this fellow, to this uh, Fraulein he was dating, and uh, he goes on the Lost blog and said, 1-800-Flowers just ruined my life. Now, I'm reading the other posts that come after that. One says, if that ruins your life, you didn't have very much life at all. Someone else writes, geez, on the contrary, I think that's terrific customer service, and I think that's exactly how I'd want my florist to act. That sounds terrific. And now you see 22 posts. The 23rd post was him back on saying, I surrender. Now, I will confess to you, of those 22, seven looked a lot like my brother's uh, comments. <laughs> but the point is, that was many years ago. Fast forward on Facebook, Twitter, we get all kinds of awards how quick we are to respond. We were cited uh, recently uh, as, uh, as the premier service provider in the social networks because our response times, even through Valentine's Day and Mother's Day, to anything on Twitter or Facebook was less than a minute. Uh, it just, our lives are changing. We have to get there, and we have to, uh, and we have to change the way we act. We're not done with the good accidents that befe befell our company. Uh, the next is uh, this past Mother's Day, this great experience I told you about we had. I get to bed Saturday night around 11.30. I'm exhausted. We've been working very, very hard for the uh, weeks leading up to Mother's Day. We're very satisfied, though, and I lie down in bed. I'm in just, I had the TV on. Saturday Night Live comes on. I'm just at the twilight point where I'm just about to doze off, 
and Kristen Wiig. You remember Kristen Wiig? She was the big star of Saturday Night Live. She left the show last year. This was her first return appearance as the guest host. And I lay there, and all of a sudden I hear our company's name, and I shot up in bed uh, to watch uh, this. This tells you that a brand has achieved something in the, uh, in the space of uh, local and uh, TV culture. Could you run that video, please? Flowers are nature's most beautiful gift. So this Mother's Day, I'm going to show my mom how much I care with a little help from 1-800-Flowers. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Oh, honey, I love these. Thank you. The gift that's as wonderful as she is. But maybe you should keep them because your apartment is so sad. Because my mom means everything to me, and I love everything about her. Excuse me? Yeah. Are there nuts in this? There are never nuts in Eggs Benedict. You don't have to ask that every time. Well, I'm sorry for double-checking, Kathleen. You're not even allergic. Nothing would happen. <laughs> I guess you could say she's my favorite person in the whole entire world. You know that mattress store downtown? Mattress factory? No. It's mattress warehouse? I don't know. The owner hanged himself. Mom? She's my role model, my best friend, and everything I hope I'll be one day. I can't find my debit card. I think my identity's been thieved. I'm sleeping! Representative. <laughs> Representative. Two, four, five. So this Mother's Day, I'm turning to 1-800-Flowers to help thank my mom for all the amazing times. Hey, what's the latest with that Leanne Rhymes girl? I have no idea. What a saga that is. Jeez. And above all, how open and honest we are with each other. Last week, your father and I watched a porno. Why would you share that with me? So call or click today and make this a Mother's Day she won't ever forget. Still can't find my debit card. Mom, I am doing a commercial. Gonna double check inside this guy. God, I wish I was a lesbian so I didn't have to carry a purse. Where are you going? Honey, it's your commercial. I didn't mean to interrupt. Come back. Come back. 1 800 Flowers. And buckle up, because Father's Day is next. Kathleen, it was an Asian porno. Dad! <laughs> we had no idea they were going to do that. They, they swiped the, uh, the logo from the website, did it beautifully. But when you're just falling asleep and all of a sudden you hear your name on Saturday Night Live, you do pay attention. But it turned out great for us. The next morning in the office, the place was a buzz. At 6 o'clock in the morning, everybody's watching this in clusters. It's the most viewed video from Saturday Night Live this year. We may have had a little something to do with that because we made sure the next week we had a task force at 6.30 about how do we make sure this gets viral, uh, which of course it did. Uh, uh, Kristen Wiig is our new favorite uh, uh, celebrity. Uh, wherever she goes, there are flowers in her life, and she doesn't know where they're coming from. Uh, <laughs> but it was a, a very creative piece. Some people thought there were some risque pieces to it. Uh, we didn't do it, so we don't care. But, uh, and, uh, and everyone in the office, all the gals in the office said, oh my god, that's my mom. <laughs> so. Uh, James suggested we uh, seek any of your questions, uh, and I'd be happy to do that now. But uh, I have the, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I have the job of uh, getting to chat with people like you, interact, look for new ideas, bring them back, cause trouble, will not be responsible for anything. I get to torture my brother on a regular basis. Ours is a family business. I started it. My folks, when they were alive, worked in the business. Uh, I'm the oldest of five, as I said. My youngest brother, Chris, the youngest. Uh, has been my partner now for, for uh, 30 of those, uh, 28 of those 37 years. Uh, I have a sister, Julie, who works on the creative side, particularly in the product development side, so she had a lot to do with the adorable product. Uh, my, our kids have all worked in the business, and our family, nieces, nephews, my kids, have to work while they're in school. As soon as they graduate from college, they can't work for us anymore. They can work somewhere else, but they, they can't work for us uh, for at least five years. We've only had one come back. My daughter came, uh, two now. My daughter came back for a while, and now she's a full-time mom. So I have, uh, she has two and a half kids. November will be my third grandchild with her. We had another one two weeks ago. Uh, so uh, my kids are behaving a lot like rabbits. My son, uh, my son uh, uh, came back to the business just uh, three years ago. He was a tech guy. He lived on the West Coast. He lived in the Midwest at a startup. Did pretty well with that. We recruited him back. He's on the production side, so I'll meet him tonight. Uh, in Miami, where we're having a meeting with a bunch of our growers uh, from uh, South America, planning our schedules for next year, making sure the relationships are good because they're critical for us. So who's got it luckier than I do? I get to work in a family business. I get to work in an industry I love. 
with people I find to be really interesting. And they, one of my other heroes, who I got to know uh, during his lifetime and, and, and work with a bunch of times, is a fellow by his name of Zig Ziglar uh, from Dallas, Texas, uh, last from Dallas, Texas. And he had a, a motto which I live by, which is, it's amazing how you can get everything you want in life as long as you're helping enough get what it is that they want. And uh, so that's the message I try and live by. And being in a flower business makes it especially easy to do that. So I'll turn now if you have any questions, be happy to those. Run, Katie, run. <laughs> Can you imagine her on that swing last night? She was quite a sight. And I never realized yeah. how much sequins uh, are your thing. <laughs> <laughs> we on? Okay. Um, I think we've got a bit of trouble with the microphone up there, but uh, hopefully it'll last. Very engaging presentation, Jim. Thank, thank you for that. Pleasure. Yeah. Um, you talked about the four waves of your business. I, I know it's incredibly hard to have a crystal ball in these matters, but you seem to have been fairly present so far. Um, can we maybe pass this one to Jim. What's next, I guess, is the, is the question. Have you any idea what, what the company will face next? What will be the next big thing for you? In terms of what's next, uh, James, I think uh, we don't have to be uh, uh, fortune tellers. We can see what's coming through the pipe. And if you look at the pipe of technology, it's all about technology. It's about how it's influencing our world. So for us, I mentioned earlier that we're focused very much on how do we shorten our delivery windows because technology is allowing that to happen. We know about Uber and what they're doing to the, uh, the car rent business. We know about uh, uh, what's going on in terms of faster, more accessible product. Everything is about mobile. Everything is about smartphones. Everything is about social. So the fourth wave for us is local, social, mobile. And it's a three-headed wave like we have on Jones Beach on Long Island. This three-headed wave is local, social, mobile. Faster, quicker, more, uh, more, uh, more real-time access, and more real-time expectations. So that's why technology is critical, that you guys need to keep up on that flow of technology to help us in our jobs to be better florists and gift uh, providers so that we can manage, the, uh, understand the expectations of our customers, meet those expectations, and every once in a while exceed those expectations. So you don't have to be uh, extremely uh, 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 a fortune teller to figure out where it's coming. It's all about technology, faster, better, quicker, in every way imaginable. And it's all mobile and it's all social. I'll tell you one last thing before we close, Katie. Being a florist, uh, we've made a lot of mistakes, but one mistake we only made once. And it was in my earliest years, and I'll, I'll close by telling you this last story. In my earliest years, I'm working at St. John's during the day, and I run into the shop in Manhattan at night, and uh, we had a couple of very talented designers. And one of my friends, uh, uh, Jerry, calls me up. He's an attorney. And one of his customers is in the insurance business. He's opened up a new insurance office. And the next evening is a cocktail party. And he's going to go to the cocktail party, uh, congratulating him on the opening of this new office. Uh, so uh, uh, Anya, I'm sure, has made a few of these in her career. But he asked me, could we make one of those uh, good luck uh, wreaths? that he'd like on a stand to congratulate them when he goes to the cocktail party the next day. So I had one of the designers make it up, and the next day I come back after being at St. John's, and I get back to the shop, and they tell me that Jerry's on the phone, and he's really annoyed. So I get on the phone with Jerry, and I said, Jerry, what's the matter? He said, I've never been so embarrassed in my life. I said, why? I, I, what is it? He says, the wreath at the uh, cocktail hour, at the grand opening. I said, what was better? He goes, oh, the wreath was beautiful. I said, I saw it myself. Before I left, it was a beautiful wreath. And he said, yes, but it said, rest in peace on the wreath. And I was mortified. I didn't know what to do. But I was, frankly, even more upset than Jerry, because I know we made two wreaths that day. And somewhere graveside in Queens was another wreath that said, good luck in your new location. <laughs> we only made that mistake once. We'll never make it again. Thank you for your time today. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>